prepare yourself. Okay, let's go. This is Coach's Corner. With each episode, we highlight a specific topic relevant to all trail runners, starting with a simple statement and then discuss the nuances that make it true, false, or somewhere in between. Our purpose is to provide you with information that you can apply to your own training. Our four coaches are Ian Sharman, Chrissy Mel, David Roach, and me, Sean Bearden. The true false for today is the purpose of some workouts for ultramarathon runners should be increasing VO2 max. So let's go in the order introduced. How about Ian? What do you say? I say true. And Chrissy? I also say true. David? False. Oh. <laughs> and I'm a false also. So we're split down the middle. I think this is the first time. <laughs> that is, yeah. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Uh, let's start back at the beginning. Ian, why true? Uh, basically because you want to have firstly variety in the training that you're doing. And frankly, the higher VO2 max is, all other things being equal, that being an important part of the phrase, the faster you're going to go with all the other running you're doing, even for super long 24 hour plus races so if you've improved your vo2 max then your cruising pace is going to be a little bit faster your engine's going to be bigger so uh, it's not the most specific part of of going much slower but it's an important part of it still okay yeah chrissy i similar i just think we should work on all the ranges that we have available to us i like to think of them as gears so if we have different gears to access while we're in an event, we'll have trained those in our different training, which VO2 max is the high end of one of those gears. Um, I also feel like it's fun. Like if we just run the same pace all the time, I mean, that's what we love to do. And that's the easy thing to go do run for hours and hours and hours. But if you get out there and you get in a, a workout that tests your VO two max or lactate threshold, those are fun and can keep you really engaged in your training. David. So I think we're all on the same page, but just coming from like a semantic difference with the word increasing, um, as it relates to VO two max. Um, and so like, I like, so a good example is with with my athletes, when they are asked like, oh, I got a free VO2 max test or should I get a VO2 max test? I'm always say, no, I don't want to know that number. I don't want them to know that number. I don't really care. Um, and it gets back to three, like three points. Um, one, it's a measure of oxygen uptake, not speed or power. So it's um, not measuring what we're interested in um, improving. Um, two, it won't budge much. So like the actual increasing number, like training to increase it has ex like, I mean, for an athlete that's trained much at all in their lives, it's not like going to increase much. There's some studies that follow elite runners over time and, you know, their VO2 max will sometimes even go down a, a hair as they age into the thirties, but they'll get faster. And so it shows that like, you know, increasing that number might not be the most important thing. Um, and three, like just there's, there's no magic in the number that it's a, it's partially derived from ease of measurement rather than something that is, um, you know, foundational to athletic performance. All that said, you know, training at VO2, at, at an intensity range that is similar to VO2, whether it's speed or uphill or whatever, is extremely important. So, um, yeah, it gets back to the increasing. And Sean, are you coming from the same? I'd like to hear your point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, where I come from is, is immediately I lock right into my research wording. And, and now I... Semantics, perhaps, but you know, VO two max is the maximum amount of oxygen our bodies can utilize in some form of activity. So it, it generally has to be some some whole body activity, and running almost fits that bill. And there's a lot of debate about whether VO two max actually exists, how to measure it, when we know it, where it is. None of that that particularly matters. But I I, I think I'm gonna I can pull all three of you together in what you've said in in my answer and my response, and that is that. Yeah, like David said, we don't get awards for VO2 max. You know, we don't get place one, two, three for who gets this value, this number. That being said, too, VO2 max is a measure of metabolism or maximal metabolic rate that a person can hold for anywhere from six to 10 minutes. And that's it. Ultra marathons are a whole lot longer than that. And we find that the longer and the longer and the longer a race is, the less predictive VO2 max 
is. In fact, even at marathon, it's beginning to break down as a predictor. It's well correlated up to that point, but even as a predictor, it starts to break down a lot. But I heard Ian mention speed and Chrissy mention gear. And that's, I think, also where David was coming in, is that what we care about are the, are the paces you can sustain for a long time. So back to the science angle, I know that there are and have been well worked out workout regimens that, at least on average, increase VO2 max most effectively or efficiently. That is, these will give you the most bang for the buck for, for most people, for the average person. Those are not the workouts, although they're very close to, but they're not the kinds of workouts that raise your maximum sustainable speeds. So for me and the athletes I coach, we never, ever, ever do workouts that are with the main purpose of raising VO2 max. Those same types of workouts on those days have the main purpose of raising your maximum sustainable speeds. As a byproduct, VO2 max tends to go up, but I don't care about that. I, don't think I think it's the next thing like you're saying, John, like what interpretation of the same words. I'm really glad that David brought up the genetics piece because that was something told to me right away. Like, like here's a number, but like you're not going to be able to move it all that much. So what, wherever range you're in, don't get hung up on that number. And I, I think that's cool that you bring that right to your athletes, David, is to telling them that. Perhaps they, like, don't worry about it. So what if it's a free test? Like, don't get your head caught on that number. I, I agree there. But whenever someone asks me about it, and I've never had a VO2 max test, I tell them it's not going to tell you much other than that if your VO2 max goes up a little bit, you'll be a bit faster, but you'll already know that because you're faster because you can <laughs> run faster times. So there's already a much more obvious way of checking that that's actually more relevant anyway. But uh, I think it, it's also an important thing to bear in mind is that I believe I'm exactly right here, but do correct me, Sean, uh, if it's wrong. But because it's related to uh, per kilo, um, it means that if you lose a little bit of weight or you got a little bit less water in you, for example, then your VO2 max would go up. Um, I believe that's the case. So therefore, a simple way of looking at it as well is if you are overweight, if you're newer to running, then just losing weight is likely to, to increase your VO2 max. So things that are making you faster and more efficient are useful. And there's an overlap there with what would in increase your VO2 max. But by measuring VO2 max, that isn't the most important element of it. It's really just one way of marking some progress there but it's it's not going to be the key thing like you say if, if you lined up a, a load of super fast guys in a 5k their vo2 maxes would give you a much better sense of what order they'll finish in if you do that in a 100 miler it's going to have some correlation but it's mainly going to come down to so many other factors especially their endurance and also just how they can deal with all the problems that occur in the in the race rather than just how fit are they in the first place but my, my answer, I'd say, comes from just the idea that the fitter you are, the better, as long as that hasn't been at the expense of something else. And equally, the faster you are, uh, that will flow through to other things as long as you haven't done that at the expense of specific training for the longer distances or hills or heat or whatever it may be that's specific to the race. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in just, just this whole idea of the purpose of the workout. And I know Ian as a as a um the coach of the month for in in strava you had an article on this early uh, in, in that series but as each of you prescribe or, or even as our listeners are thinking about their workout for the day and they're trying to design you know what is the purpose of this workout and have have i designed it properly for that purpose do you do that so concretely when you are prescribing do you really think, here's the workout, and I know this is specifically the purpose? Or is it looser than that? It's at a higher level. So I'm sure the other guys would be very similar here, but I'll just say the four different types of run that I always include, which is stuff to improve your speed, your endurance, your hills, or recovery. Everything fits into one of those categories with an overarching element of there should be fun in there. And if you're not enjoying things, then uh, you've got to adjust things that way. But there's always a reason behind the run rather than just getting in some miles. And that allows people to be a bit more focused and a bit more structured in what they're aiming for. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's fascinating. I, like, and I think that it really gets back to the core element of the true false question. Um, and I mean, I think one thing is 
it's helpful to think about how VO2 max was derived in the first place. And Steve Magnus has a lot of great writing on the fallacy of VO2 max in his opinion. Um, and, and one of the things he cites is back in the 1920s when they found, when they discovered the concept of VO2 max or, or first like found it in a, in a lab, essentially they saw that there was a point where no, not a substantial amount more oxygen could be taken up and it was measurable in a lab. And as a result, all of the exercise science very shortly out and, you know, the decades after really focused on this variable, but the body in practice is so much more complicated than that. Um, and how it works, you know, there's no, no like point that is the switch each day and is like a universal principle for that athlete. Um, and I think that that goes back to the purpose of workouts too, is that there's no like siloed purpose to each workout. So, you know, the way Ian framed it's amazing. Um, but you know, I'm sure if you break those down a little bit more, like if Ian's giving, let's say a, a two minute hill rep or something, like there's no exact way that two minute hill rep needs to be run to improve their hill running ability. You know, they're, they're going to take what they have on the day. They're going to apply some general principles about effort that Ian's given them or, or their coach has given them, and then they're going to execute. But if the hill rep is five seconds slower or five seconds faster, it's not eliciting like a, a substantially different training stimulus most of the time because the body isn't working on these like binary functions usually, um, you know, with obviously with exceptions. So, um, so yeah, like I, for, for me with athletes, I like to give really general advice rather than, and then let them find the, their sweet spot only correcting after the fact rather than over prescribing things. And I think for people listening, you know, I would say that pace based intervals, like, you know, saying you're going to hit a 400 at this pace might be overselling some of the, you know, the certainty of how your body's working rather than, um, you know, trying to kind of, kind of trying to dance with it as opposed to like make it into a, a math equation. So just a question for all of you, do you prescribe workouts and say, do it at X minutes per mile, or do you do uh, more effort based or, or even heart rate potentially based, um, prescriptions for runs? Uh, I'm definitely more effort based. And a lot of times with the athletes I work with, it's how do, how do I know if I'm going at steady or up tempo or easy or whatever? And I do it a lot by like, how many words could you speak in a certain amount of time? So if like it, it per breath, really, like, so if you could have a conversation before you need to take a breath, like we are here, that's pretty easy pace. If you're <gasps> gasping to say one word at a time, then that's, you're almost close to your high end zone five, however you want to decipher it. One thing I just wanted to add, you guys were getting specific with each workout. I feel as coaches and I, I, for me, it's really important to have the overarching view of the whole week, building block, month, then the cycle all the way out to the race. And like what those little workouts do each day, it's helpful for us to have those big, big overviewing uh, approach for the athlete to help them see that if they were five seconds slower on the 400 meter repeats this week versus next week and how that all plays into the big goal, not just each day. So in addition to what each workout is doing, helping keep in, t in tune with what the big picture is going to unfold and release for them. And how to adjust it, of course, based on that as well. Yeah. yeah as life comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it is for me primarily effort based, you know, here and there every once in a while, I certainly have an athlete who comes from a background that they've been looking at their watch a whole lot for their workouts. And, and so we, we do talk about heart rates and maybe do some field tests. So I understand where their heart rates fit into given efforts. So I ask them to do something that reports an effort back to me, like a talk test along with the heart rate. So I start calibrating that so I can give them feedback, but we always try to transition over to really understanding how things should feel. So the same with you, David, as well. Yeah, I think Sean and I are probably coming in you guys coming from a similar place. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the issue sometimes with um, things like VO2 max is just that when people like focus on that or, or fixate on that variable, they end up like often pushing themselves far too hard in these workouts, which is weird to think. But um you know, you'll like, I'm sure Sean on his field test will see some people that if they think they're doing a VO2 max workout, will do things like 
like let's say they're doing 400 meter repeats just for ease of um, comparison. Like it'll essentially be 400, like a number of 400 meter races, like, you know, at their most sustained, at, at the fastest pace. Thing. And that, I mean, I think that that gets back to like, you know, they're, like, because they're not viewing themselves a little bit more holistically with the understanding that it does matter, you know, so we're, so VO2 max matters, but what matters within that is more about the running economy. So I think the most helpful frame for people listening might be instead of thinking VO2 max, that's what you want to improve. Instead of that, what you want to improve is your velocity at VO2 max, which is a running economy or your power output at VO2 max. If you're going uphill, um, which I think gives a little bit more leeway for the athlete. Um, but yeah, Sean, I'd be really interested to know how you like pro like get at this maximum sustainable speed thing that you mentioned and how you, what, like what framework you're coming at when you say that. Yeah. So the framework really centers around the uh, concept of critical power, critical velocity. And it, and it's ba that's based on the reason that that to me is one of two, the only two things that I actually consider true thresholds. The, mass, the majority of the things that people talk about as thresholds really aren't true thresholds. But this one is, and it's also called the fatigue threshold. And that's simply because at work rates above that, we can absolutely predict when a person will fatigue. It's remarkable how in some of the some of the science they show videos of of people where their critical velocity has been determined exactly and their their ability to work above that work prime w prime or distance prime above that has been calculated and they get on the track and they'll sh will show races races of them and say you know in olympic trials or whatever and you and there you see and there's a clock on the top of this clock, a countdown of here's what they've got left based on their pace and you'll you'll see these people go around and they're going flying 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 and suddenly suddenly woof, they're getting past right when the <laughs> clock hits zero. It's incredible. Because it's so predictable, it's absolutely locked in above critical velocity. Below that, things get totally messy. And so, you know, we could talk for a very long time on what's known and not known about the mechanisms of fatigue there, but that's the point that I always am working on trying to get raised for people, their ability to work above it and that actual level. And um, so really the two things that we focus on are a person's speed for a given effort. So increasing speed for any given effort and reducing the effort for any given duration. So I'm gonna run an hour. I want it to be easier at this, you know, at a, a maximum hour effort needs to feel easier. How does an athlete um, think about their, that, critical like what you're talking about there um i don't want to get terminology mixed up since well, no, it's, I know it's okay it's like the tin man the tom schwartz critical velocity <laughs> or if it's different or the same yeah. i know isn't that the thing like every time we start we put a label out there or, or, and then then suddenly the definition <laughs> starts migrating as people pick it up but um so there's a very easy way to ru fairly roughly um quantify critical velocity on flat terrain and it, that is, it's a three minute all out test. You warm up and then as awful as it sounds, you, you, you sprint absolute all out hundred percent sprint, no pacing, nothing <laughs> for three minutes. And, and the last 30 to 45 seconds is that's actually your very, very close to your critical, velo critical velocity pace. Anything really? just below that you should be able to sustain for a very long time where fatigue would come from say glycogen depletion. Um, maybe thermoregulation above that is where we can, where we well we can predict exactly when you're going to fatigue. Uh, but that's super, you know, it's super hard, but it, it does only take three minutes. So I've, we've, I do that with some athletes for most people though, honestly, I mean, really, once you start understanding how things are supposed to feel, you can feel the transition. You got, you, you guys know this, you can feel the transition across the lactate threshold. You, you go just a little faster and there's just a sense that you have. You just, you're like, yeah, I just lock, I just, I just crossed the barrier. This is hour, hour and a half sustainable, like, but it's going to hurt. 
it, we feel that. And, and that's really what I work on most with my athletes is feeling that, giving feedback. Well, how does it feel? Where are you? And eventually, I mean, it take, can, can take years for some people, but, you know, at least many, many months for a lot of others. Anyway, that's the short answer to how to test that. And for some people, they do actually um, prescribe workouts based around that. But the problem is it's, that's flat. As soon as we go over rough terrain, as soon as we go up or down hills, it's a whole new thing. We're recruiting different muscles. It's different values. And there's just no way of coming up with a specific test like that that's going to give us anything that translates into real world trail running for all the variability. That's why it comes back to effort again. Sure. No, I, I think that's the really important thing here is that even if you can measure these things, it, it's how does that actually help you be a better runner? And that's the practical thing that people can take away from it. And so doing that test doesn't necessarily make you better at judgments. I mean, it might help a little bit for the high end stuff, but a, a similar way that I like to incorporate um, that improvement in judgment of effort is getting people to, especially if they're not used to doing short distance races, by which I mean marathon and below, which is not normal definition for short distance races. But it, by doing, say, a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon, a marathon, on a road, so there's fewer variables, it gives them much better sense of how to pace, what is sustainable. Sometimes they're able to push a bit harder than they maybe did in the past, especially if they're not used to speed work. But it's it's the same kind of concepts there, that if they can get better at doing those things, using Chrissy's word, which is one I, I use with my clients as well, they get more gears and they get a sense of how far can you go at this intensity, not just this pace, but this intensity. So if it's uphill or at altitude or a hot day, they can allow for those things much better. And that is the really practical stuff that is totally related to this. But just knowing your VO2 max number is not giving you any practical stuff on race day of how to do things better. So, David, you've been asking questions. I'm, let's, bounce, let's bounce a question <laughs> straight, straight to you. How do you help your athletes to get to understand those paces that Ian's talking about to say you know, it's a it's a 50K, 50K race. There are some really good flat parts. There are some steep ups and downs. How do I, let's say, if I'm your athlete, how, how do I know that effort sense for flat versus up that's sustainable where I cross the line and collapse over the 50K for my best effort? Well, I think we're all calibrating our efforts in training. So if the training doesn't prepare someone to understand where those, you know, those physiological points kind of lie, because you're taking in so much complex information when you find that, like there's no cue that a coach can give an athlete that lets them know whether something is sustainable or not. Like Christy was giving some great examples of talking and stuff, but even that, if you're really hyped up, like we've all had those experiences where we're probably talking at 175 heart rate. Um, or, you know, if you're looking at like the, the complex elements of physiology, like neuromuscular fatigue and all these other things that you notice where like you get a little sleepy on a climb or whatever. So in other words, you're taking in hundreds of data points, probably like unknowingly and combining that to an effort number. And probably the only way to really do that in practice is to experience it in training. So when it comes to like racing a 50 K and pacing, um, you know, I think if an athlete, an athlete needs to do some like essentially tempo style running, like running that approximates these fatigue variables within longer runs. So they're also having some glycogen depletion and that allows them to kind of find their own way with that because effort will also be different for different athletes. I mean, you know, Zach Miller being an example of someone who his RPE is probably like out on a one to 10 scale is probably nine or 10 for an entire 50 K because of the way he's able to, the way he can like races and hit, he can use effort. Whereas for someone like me, you know, I need to be a five or I'm going to blow up at the end. And I often blow up. I mean, if you follow my racing at all, I often, you know, I either win off the front or get passed because that's kind of how my system works. So I think that, and then when it comes to shorter stuff, like VO2 max style stuff, now that we're talking about that, um, I think it, a lot of it comes down to playing with your rest intervals. So a good example would be, like, let's say an athlete is doing six by two minutes, which, or, or, or something along those lines. Um, if you give an athlete, if an athlete takes three minutes of rest in between each of those, it's a very different experience in how hard they decide to push themselves than if you give them one minute of rest. And so over time, like playing with those rest, the, the rest breaks, rest intervals, lets an athlete um, find that. But I think it's complicated. I mean, I'd be really interested to know 
how like how Chrissy, how you do it, especially given like some of that, you know, where you're coming from with coaching athletes. Oh, sorry. Right as the dog going to start barking too. <laughs> I've had it on mute and she's been quiet the whole time and now she's going to get excited. Um, Ian, do you want to answer and I'll go get her quiet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear from Ian. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I mean, um, one thing you mentioned there about perceived effort, I mean, obviously, the whole point is it's perceived by you rather than it being some uh, objective scale that you could directly compare. So I, I think it's exactly the same. You, you just want people to have a lot of different gears that they're testing out. So changing the amount of recovery time between intervals, doing different types of intervals, two minute intervals, three minute, four, five uh, mile repeats. It, basically, there's a lot of different things you can do. And also, that's an important key part of training as well is uh, having the variety to keep providing a new stimulus rather than just doing the same workout again and again, getting awesome at that workout and therefore getting diminishing returns from it and not improving your fitness as much. So I would say it's, it's mainly just making sure there's variety there. And another key rule of thumb I use here is that if there's a type of workout that one of my runners doesn't like, we try and work out why that is. Is it just that, you know, it's it's miserable weather or they don't like going to that place or something? If it's more to do with they don't like how that effort feels, it usually means it's kind of the weakest link. So maybe they're not very strong uphill. So that's the thing they don't like doing. So we try and find ways they'll enjoy it more. But knowing that we're trying to work on the weakest link as well, because in a race, your weakest link is where you're going to lose a lot of time. So I'm not sure if that fully answered it, but that was meandering from the point. <laughs> I mean, that. That's, I think that's a good summary of like how my brain works anyway. Um, are you, um, when you find their weakest link, do you like, do you focus on that or do you, like, do you train the weak the strengths or do you train the weaknesses more? Like, I mean, I know that it's both, but like, do you have a specific like more focus on the weaknesses because people want to do the workouts they can already do well. Like I love downhills, so I just want to do downhills the whole time. But it doesn't really make me any better at downhills. It just uh, creates a lot more risk and, and also means that I'm not spending time on the stuff that will really matter. So I, I try to get a balance there because, again, it comes down to the best training is the training they're actually going to do. And if you give them a whole load of workouts they don't want to do and then they, oh, I somehow didn't do that one or was a bit busy at work that day, then they're not getting any benefit at all. So it's about getting that balance right. But I would focus more on things that are – especially perceived weaknesses. So it's not just about improving their physical ability to do it, but also improving their confidence and psychology behind it as well. I think that's the key bit is um, communication. You asked what it takes with the clients that I work with. And a lot of them are really new to running period, not just ultra running. And so tuning into the body through talking, talking about their experience with a different workout or different pacing or where do they even find a hill or how to like, what's the right grade? I get a lot of those kind of questions. And then it's in that conversation, both before and after the workouts of giving them, this is the intention, this is the why, and then rehashing the experience after. So just that like ability to help people tune in. I, and it's so cool to watch people get it like it, or to hear it. I guess it's on a phone call. <laughs> not, yeah. To hear people, um, have those little breakthroughs of understanding in their own body. So that's, I'm so, I, I'm so fascinated by that because like, if you're taking someone like a lot of the times I imagine when like, like if I start coaching an athlete, that's pretty advanced. Like, they already know a lot of the answers to these questions. And so you can guide them, but like, you're only changing a little bit. Like if you're starting with someone that doesn't even know the questions, like, like you were talking about, like what, aside from like the breathing, is there anything else that you focus on in like, in, in helping them figure this out. Like I, I wouldn't even know, I wouldn't know. A lot of it just happens from the honest dialogue. So yeah. though yeah. they might write a note in, an, in their spreadsheet, you know, me and my spreadsheets, they might not write a note in their spreadsheet that triggers a thought for how I can help them relate better to what they're feeling or, and that might, it's not even a coming from a place of understanding that that's why they wrote it. So it sounds a little, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, that's your next taking it in mm -hmm. for what it is, really. Yeah, and you've I mean, done decades of pattern recognition to find to like get the ability to do that to help them. Um, yeah, I'm fascinated by that because it reminds me a little bit of um, like a, one of the critiques of VO2 max, for example, is about the central governor model, um, like by Tim Noakes, that there's other things that are holding you back or that you know are are limitations to performance. 
and VO2 max isn't necessarily measuring all of them. And so that's getting more to like the effort style things where you're talking about brain and uh, neuromuscular th things that are not even fully understood. Um, so yeah, I mean, I like, yeah, Sean, I, I'd be like, obviously whenever you, you've done all the research on this and, you know, know a million times more, I mean, is there anything about that topic that really jumps out to you as something that like runners should like from the science that runners should take into their own planning and training. Can you ask that a different way? I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. I understand the question exactly. So it's really a question. It was basically me saying, Sean, you've listened to us. You've listened to me ramble. <laughs> what, what corrections are there to make? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I don't think there are any uh, corrections here. We can spend a lot of time going into the nuances of, of of VO2 max, you know, what it is, how it's measured. I'm, I'm blown away. Ian, you've never had a VO2 max test. Nope. No, I, I think I've had one offer to do it, but yeah. for exactly that reason, I didn't see any information. It would really tell me, I don't think my VO2 max is very high. Like my short distance times are not very high and I'm, uh, I'm 150 pounds, which is basically a fat marathoner <laughs> for a pro level anyway. Well, so <laughs> well, can... You know, when you compare to like a 110 pound guy, it's, it's not in those kind of ranges. So, I, I also, it's more just an ego thing. I didn't want to get like a low number and just feel bad about myself. So I didn't think that would help me a whole lot. <laughs> so one day, one day I was, we used to do, I used to do, you know, the, a lot of these, right. And I was uh, conducted them and was the subject for so, so many. But so one day I was on the, on the bike and I'm watching the screen. You're not supposed to really watch the screen, but I'm watching the screen because I wanted to hit a certain number and I'm pedaling. This is on bike. I'm pedaling, I'm pedaling. And I was like, okay, I, I'm not going to look at the screen. I'm really just going to push it. And I pushed it and I finished and I looked over at the screen and I was like 0. 0.2 away from milliliters per kilogram per minute, away from what I wanted. And I was so mad. I started the whole test over again and did a back-to-back -back one and just kept watching <laughs> the number until I broke the point. You were able to get it? Yeah. Second time? Yeah. Well, that's fascinating, right? But that's 0.2, pretty... I mean, you know, but yes, you're right. You're right. Wait, it shows that a lot of it's psychological there that it's, uh, is it going to help you be a better runner? And something that could be negative for you. I mean, also, if I check my VO2 max and it was off the charts high, I just think, oh, m maybe I should be quicker than I am. It, it, there's no good thing that would come out of it. The, the practical thing is, am I getting quicker with training? Or is the person I'm coaching getting quicker with training? And that's the thing that I, I'd care about. So I think it's it can be a distraction. But also, just going back to the very initial question is, I think a lot of people use VO2 max as shorthand for speed. Right. Increase your VO2 max, get faster. When obviously scientifically that's not exactly what it is, but the idea of being more efficient in your oxygen intake and being able to, to get more oxygen to the muscles uh, and therefore have a bigger power output, that is the relevant thing, but not necessarily needing to measure it to the nearest decimal point. And I think that that takes me back to, it seems like I deflected David's question, and, but I'll roll right back to it with this. We can talk about all those details and those nuances, and I love to do it from critical velocity to different thresholds to VO2 max and to all these things and the, and the underlying physiology of all of it. What is most important to me though, when we have dialogue and we talk about these things and it comes, it comes back to exactly the, the question that are the two true false that we posed today. It's really knowing what you're talking about when we're talking about things, because I just, I think that when runners start talking with runners, we get off onto those tangents of, of slippery definitions of things. And before you know it, we're not really speaking the right same language. And we're saying one thing when we actually mean another. So for me, when we say something like, should we increase VO2 max? For the most part, we kind of understand what we're saying. But for me, it comes down to, is that really what we want? Because I feel like if we, we, we have to be careful Slippery is one thing. Once we start sliding, now we're doing something we never intended to do and we're missing what we want to do. Be really critical about what you mean when you're saying the words that you know what you're saying, you know, and then you're, then that you're following into it. So that brings me to try to pull it back all the way around. If we all agree that we don't care about the specific number for VO2 max, then even if we've said true or false for this for a different nuanced reasons, we probably all agree that we're never going to get that test to see that the workout raised that number. So we probably all agree that it's not really VO2 max we're trying to increase per se. It's some ability or capacity or something within that. 
And so I guess my question then is for you, when we are thinking about this genre of workouts, what is it really that you are, or maybe one or two or three things, different workouts that you're, that you want to actually accomplish what in, in the, in the terms of a capacity that the athlete has or an ability. So um, I can just jump in with one quick point for that. I think we talked about on a past podcast, which is when, when I'm thinking about these types of workouts, um, I found that athlete, they usually like, involve intervals, repeats of some type, three minutes or less for me. Like when you're thinking about this particular top end capacity, like a sustainable, not like a sustainable speed where you're really putting out effort somewhere between 3k and 5k or even like you know in that like if you were going to race those distances somewhere around there um i found that when you when you start doing repeats longer than three minutes you're starting to click into other styles of running for that athlete like their their paces and their power outputs will usually will often drop off pretty substantially though maybe that varies for other people and sean has some great research on a similar topic not exactly that i read once um so yeah essentially um shorter intervals i think are usually better for most athletes especially doing ultras because we're not trying this is totally non-specific to the event um so you're just looking at these capacities and work zones um so i'm a huge fan of one two three i mean you know minute is arbitrary but like those those levels of like duration for intervals on this end and why what what is it you're trying to specifically build for that for the athletes when you're doing that well i mean the shorthand would be velocity at vo2 max but with that what we're trying to get at there is just running economy at top end sustainable speeds that don't involve like massive drop-offs by the end of the workout so probably getting to some of the the variables you're talking about but essentially viewing running economy like the amount of energy an athlete uses to go a given pace as a spectrum where you can't ne- totally neglect one end to get to the farthest point, acknowledging that these faster, like velocity at VO2 max as shorthand is completely nonspecific. And an athlete could probably skip it entirely and do, do very well in a hundred miler. But if you do that over time, you can start building workouts on top of themselves that improve velocity at VO2 max, even as the VO2 max number stays steady. And that's how an athlete goes from, you know, being at one level one year to 10 years later being 10% faster, 20% faster, um, without any like underlying, um, without the VO2 max number at least changing, um, even as like you're, you're working other things. And just for anybody who doesn't know what velocity of YouTube max is, let's just recap. It's the slowest velocity at which sustained you will drift to VO2 max. So low, it's the yeah. slowest velocity you can go where you will attain VO2 max. Um, Ian or, or Chrissy, or, uh, Chrissy, what is it specifically you're looking to build for your athletes when you're doing those kinds of workouts? I would I go back to that simple word gears. And because we were gonna, getting into the semantics of like, by calling it VO2 max, what are you really trying to do with that? It's, I, I think a more general term is gears. And even when you rattled off your four that the workouts all fit within, I feel like when I'm building a week and then building a building block and then seeing that how the end of the building block leads to recovery, those are where I'm really focused is that overall picture of how all of these pieces fit into giving an athlete all the tools they need when they get to race day. So I I think I I hope that's answering it and just being very general in terms of trying not to get caught into too many words that are too specific that maybe I'm misinterpreting. No, I I didn't mean to put anybody on edge either with the way I I laid that that out. No, but it sounds like pace is what you're really after there. So you're after those, that higher gear, meaning sort of that higher ability. And maybe it's not pace too, because it could be slower and uphill, but it's a, it's an, an ability of a harder effort. At that and just having the tools in the basket for when they get to these longer distances because that's it's whether running's a new experience to them or going the furthest distance they've ever gone is the new experience when they are in the race do they have something accessible whether it was an experience that we talked about a run that they did that recovery week that they're recalling on so that they have the oomph to get out of the aid station chair and go again it's all about all the different pieces that play out in your brain as you're going for the the end goal of whatever that is, whether it's a race or a long training run or an adventure. 
Yeah. Ian? And I'd use that same concept of gears as well. That's, that's, I think, a really easy way for people to understand it. So I would say to someone, if, for example, if you want to get faster, maybe you, that might mean to you running a, a 5K PR. So that, that's kind of what, especially for long distance runners, we think of 5K as being kind of the ultimate speed test. So um, getting better at the 5K does not necessarily mean that you are better at the 100 miles. But the way I look at it is trying to have the gears of in between. So if you improve some, some of your training is about trying to improve how well you could run a 5K, but you're also doing stuff that improves how you do a 10K and a half marathon and a marathon and a 50K and a 50 mile, and you have all the building blocks in between, that's where I think it can be useful there. So obviously you bias towards the more specific stuff, but by having all these different gears in between, it can provide that link so that some of that top end speed can actually be usable at the slower paces as well by having all bits in between. And that's also why I like the idea of doing multiple shorter distance races, not just to get used to what those intensities feel like, but also to, in, to improve those a little bit. But you know, if someone going into a hundred miler, they're not gonna be peaking for a 5K at the same time, but I would like them to feel like they could run a half decent 5K at that point, rather than they've just done a whole load of long, slow stuff and they haven't done a speed session for six months. And my athletes typically do these types of workouts year round, maybe with, you know, a little more in some periods and a little less in other periods, but it's, it's never sort of big block periods where they're missing it for six weeks or something we're always doing these kinds of workouts. Is that the same for all of you or do you approach it differently? The, the only caveat I'd say is maybe if they've just had an off season or an injury, sure. maybe that first month doesn't have the high intensity stuff, but the rest of the time, yes. Yeah. Sorry, maybe switching gears a little bit in that period, like you're saying, Ian, where turning the focus on to something that would maybe simulate that. So a lot of times strength becomes a piece that I'll integ integrate in that point so that one, it gets ingrained that this is an important part of my training so that when the mileage keeps adding, an athlete wants to continue to focus on their own strength building and, and work as well. When I say that, like um, maybe getting in the gym a little bit more, not just running strength, but um, cross training, if you will. Um, but I think it's good to keep the body in tune and reminded of what all is capable. Cause if we don't use it, we lose it kind of mentality. So just checking in with it throughout, but maybe just not as intense like you're saying. Yeah. I mean, totally on board with the little exception that I think it might. So in general, these more intense style VO2 quote unquote VO2 max workouts, speed style stuff, I usually don't, depending on an athlete's background and physiology, don't have athletes do like in the essentially anywhere from two to four weeks before a hundred mile or longer races. I think it might just be my coaching that puts them in the place, but basically Megan and I, my wife Megan and I got a lot of data early on that the, the closer those workouts were to race day, often the, the more variable athletes' performances were, um, and it might be related to muscle fiber recruitment or, or other things where, you know, going into the race or even aerobic efficiency. But um, yeah, that's where uh, pretty much though, I totally agree, year-round emphasis on, on- But David, you would do speed sessions in those last two to four weeks. You just wouldn't do the really high-end ones. Is that what you're saying? So we'll, we would do like hill strides and things like that, but honestly, nothing that- when we're talking about VO2 max, essentially, yeah, yeah n nothing that would be the the 10 to 15 minutes of pretty hard intervals separated by recovery. Um, you know, there would be some tempo runs where you're 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 going much easier. Um, maybe some maybe some short re reintros of like 30 second strides with with short recovery, where no one essentially we try to avoid like touching fast twitch fibers as much as possible before these ultras. Not because like we know that that is the way it needs to work for everyone, more because like for our coaching, our particular coaching style, we found that when athletes did that early on, um, they often underperformed relative to what we expected. Whereas the opposite is also true, where there was overperformance in athletes that maybe went in a little bit slower to their hundred than um, they were six weeks before. Um, though that could also be noise not signal um, and a lot of that's bound to be psychological as well of just you know sometimes and uh, this is totally off topic but i just want i think it's a good point here <clears throat> that sometimes when people go into a race and they think they've had awesome training and they're the fittest they've ever been 
they screw it up because they don't listen to the signals their body's giving them. They just think it's going to be easy and they'll nail it. That's an exaggeration, but that's a gist of that. Um, while if someone goes into it, maybe not feeling quite as fast as they want to be, sometimes they then just are really good at tuning into their body because that's what they're listening at, uh, listening to rather than just going off regardless at a certain pace or with the leader or something. So I think that there's, there's all the factors that come together. But like I said in the very first uh, part of my answer was that it, it, all other things being equal, if you're faster, that's a good thing. But other things may be hindered by that, uh, including getting overconfident. So certainly injuries, off-season, and tapering periods are going to be a little bit different. They need to be certainly much more specific. And Chrissy, you said use it or lose it, and that also brought up to me something maybe I should have commented on earlier when we were talking about this topic. But the idea of VO2 max and, and also speeds that we can sustain for a long time comes out in, the, in these detraining periods because we lose those two capacities at different rates. Or, or we sustain them by doing different things. That's another way of, of also viewing that. So it does show that while they those sorts of things do trend together, there are underlying components that are that are quite different. And so just back again to why why it's important to be specific about really what we're after. I'd be psyched to get into that a little bit, that detraining part and how they come out and that sounds really cool. <laughs> well, maybe maybe some aspect of tapering too. Tapering or time off um, should be something of a of a future a future topic. I think we're, we're getting that a, sounds like a good one. Yeah, I, people don't know, but offline we're we're bringing up different topics among each other, and we're, and we're getting some from from listeners, and, and so we're getting this backlog. Maybe we start doing have to start mm -hmm. doing these a little more often. Any last words from each of you on this on this topic? Something we can summarize or a take home message maybe some something that somebody can begin to implement any thoughts that you haven't brought out yet that you thought you might want to so i think while vo2 max itself like doesn't have that much uh utility for almost any athlete it does there some of the principles that co-developed with vo2 max over time have a ton of utility so essentially the, this physiological variable adapt like was came of age at the same time coaching methodology came of age. So just because you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, that sort of thing, where um, the old VO2 style principles of 10 to 15 minutes of total workload separated by a certain amount of recovery is a really good way to get at other adaptations um, that happen to, um, you know, work to, that, that, Initially, people were like, oh, this is to improve VO2 max, but it also does like good, it does good things outside of that. And I think that that comes from some coaching expertise that developed at the same time and then kind of was found justifications for it. So what I would say to people listening is um, don't be afraid of speed. Like um, do, do some short intervals that might traditionally be referred to as VO2 max intervals, but don't care about the exact pace you're going or the number that you're that's output in a lab or anything like that. Um, stay in touch with your speed as Sean, Chrissy and Ian said, but um, stay in touch with your speed in like a loving and holistic way. I suppose my one overarching comment would just be make sure you're doing training at a lot of different paces and intensities. So whether you're thinking of those top end ones as VO2 max or not is, is not as useful, but it's more just making sure that you have those different gears and that you don't get stuck running lots of stuff in the kind of medium effort because it's going to provide less of a stimulus and you're going to be in your comfort zone and not get as, uh, as well-rounded as a runner as you would otherwise. Chrissy? Yeah, this the, the summary bit would just be like not getting too hung up on the number, like the genetic piece of it and how much you really can or can't move it. If you got too excited about, I'm going to change my VO2 max, like there's enough science showing that that's really not going to happen. And it, I guess more to the approach of how I like working with people is just tuning into your body and how you're feeling. And then if you see some results by doing, we do like that three minute test. That's a great one in terms of showing a, a concrete thing. Like, look, you're feeling this way and then the pace changed. Or if you want to get into numbers, do it with stuff that's really like in front of you as opposed to some machine that you have to go test on. I don't know. I'm just saying stay away from getting too focused on the numbers. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, my final words are not my own. They, they're uh, Michael, jo uh, Michael Joyner's, Dr. Michael Joyner's 
Um, he has never written a book. And he said the reason he hasn't written a book is because he's written a haiku. And it's run a lot of miles, some of them extremely fast, rest once in a while. And I think that covers a whole lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're out of a job. That, that covers it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, all. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.